This is Read Japanese Literature. My name is Allison Fincher. Read Japanese Literature is a podcast about Japanese fiction and some of its best works. All the works we discuss are available in translation, so you can read along if you want. You can find out more at readjapaneseliterature.com. Quick content warning the end of the world isn't exactly a cheerful subject. We'll be briefly reviewing some of the upsetting events in Japanese history that influenced apocalyptic literature there. In particular, World War II, including the Battle of Okinawa, and several natural disasters, including the Triple Disasters of March 2011. This episode will mention death and rape, both historical and fictional, although it won't go into any graphic detail. The protagonist of Haruki Murakami's Q Teen 84 believes that everyone, deep in their hearts, is waiting for the end of the world to come. I don't know whether she's right, but I do know that I've spent my entire reading life reading and loving apocalyptic and dystopian fiction. One of the first novels I remember reading is a middle grade post apocalyptic novel called This Time of Darkness by Helen Mary Hoover. It's about an 11 year old in a dystopian future society that controls the underclasses by refusing to teach them to read. Because I have this lifelong interest in apocalyptic fiction, I was struck by some of the first novels I encountered in Japanese translation Mariko Ohara's Hybrid Child, Hiroko Oyamada's The Factory, Haruki Murakami's Q Teen 84. I'll come back to these titles later, I promise. As I read, it seemed to me that Japanese apocalyptic fiction was doing something that English language apocalyptic fiction just wasn't. Although at the time, I couldn't put my hand on what. And it seemed like maybe Japanese apocalyptic fiction was ahead of its time compared to English language apocalyptic fiction. All of this is what I want to explore in this episode. I'm also trying something new. For the past year or so, I've poured my heart into a topic, produced one 45 minute episode, and then felt guilty and pressured for a month about how long it takes me to prepare the next episode. I wondered what would happen if I devoted as many episodes as it takes to tell you everything I've learned about Japanese apocalyptic fiction. The two part episode on misogyny and Mishima went over well enough that I thought this was a good time to give it a try. It might even help me shorten the time between episode releases. I know this is different. I'd love to hear from you whether it works for you or not. Let me know through the website or through Blue Sky. Patreon supporters are always very welcome to provide me feedback that way. And so, in this multi part episode, We're going to talk about apocalyptic and dystopian fiction, stories of the end of the world. There will be some overlap with last year's episode about Japanese science fiction. In fact, you might want to go back and take a listen, not necessary, just some good background information. I'm going to start out with a description of apocalyptic fiction as a genre, and I'll include its cousin of sorts, dystopian fiction. By the time we get to the 19th and 20th centuries, this will be mostly a story from the English speaking world. I'll clarify why we're covering it anyway. Maybe you'll hear a mention of some of your own favorites. I'll move on to a history of apocalyptic fiction in Japan. Almost all the titles I'll mention, as usual, are available in English translation, and there'll be a more comprehensive list of what's translated on the episode page. We'll end with the biography of writer Yoko Tawada, another one of my favorites, and her novel, The Emissary, translated by Margaret Mitsutani. The Emissary was also published under the title The Last Children of Tokyo. It's the same translation by the same translator. Let me also mention that I'll be giving a lot of examples of different books in this episode, and you'll be able to find several lists of books on the episode page. Japanese tales about the end of the world, manga and anime of special note, that means things that are particularly relevant to the topic we're discussing, other tales of the end of the world, 
books by Yoko Tawada, and then, as usual, a general list of the stories this episode also mentions. If you are planning to buy any of these stories and you're a North American shopper, please consider purchasing them through the website or our bookshop.org page. It's a great way to support the podcast, and there are free links to a couple of the earlier short stories that are already out of copyright. As always, the very best way to support the podcast is by joining our Patreon. We have more than 20 supporters now, and I'm grateful to each and every one of you. This episode required a good bit more background reading than usual. I was very grateful to know so many people were cheering on the podcast and for the financial support that helped pay for the books I needed to read. You can join them at patreon.com slash read Japanese literature. Let's begin with some vocabulary. The word apocalypse didn't start having anything to do with the end of the world. It comes from the Greek word apokalypsis, meaning literally lifting the veil. It's all about uncovering a secret truth. The current meaning of apocalypse is either an event involving destruction or damage on a catastrophic scale, up to and including the end of the world, or it means the complete and final destruction of the world as described in the last book of the Christian Bible, usually titled the Book of Revelation. That book begins with the word apocalypsis. So maybe you can see the link here. This revealing, unveiling book gives away a secret truth about destruction, ergo, apocalypse. According to tradition, John, one of the apostles of Jesus, wrote the Book of Revelation around 95 CE. Within the century, the meaning of the word apocalypsis had changed to, more or less, the meaning of apocalypse we use today. When we talk about apocalyptic fiction, we usually mean fiction about the end of the world. We can also talk about post-apocalyptic fiction, fiction that takes place after the world as we know it has already ended. And we can talk about the trans-apocalypse, the apocalypse as it happens. The trans-apocalypse is a term for right now. The world of the fruits of late-stage capitalism, rising nationalism, and a failure to meaningfully address global climate change. Perhaps a pessimistic or cynical term, not to be confused with the massive assault on the rights of transgender people, which is a huge problem I don't mean to dismiss, A quick Google search shows the term is sometimes shared. It's difficult to completely separate apocalyptic fiction from its cousin of sorts, dystopian fiction. Dystopia comes from the Greek dus, bad, and topos, place. Some people treat it as the antonym or opposite of the fictional utopia of Sir Thomas More. Sir Thomas used his book, Utopia, to describe an ideal society. Topia, again, from topos, place, and you from no, as in a utopia is a place that cannot really exist. Many people think it's from you, meaning good, like eudaimonia, if you've ever studied Greek philosophy, but it's not. It's from u, no. So utopia is not actually the opposite of dystopia. In fact, some dystopias come about from people's attempts to make perfect societies. Apocalyptic stories have been around at least as long as human beings have been able to record their own stories. Many of the oldest involve floods. There's no geological evidence there was ever a global flood on the scale described in these stories, But there are several plausible theories about more local catastrophic floods that might have affected early human populations. The destruction might have been so memorable that it got passed down for thousands of years and then recorded in scriptures all over Western and Central Asia, 
For example, the ancient Mesopotamian epic of Gilgamesh describes angry gods sending floods to punish humanity. That was written somewhere between 3,200 and 4,000 years ago. The Sanskrit Dharmasastra, written in the second millennium BCE, includes an apocalyptic flood. The Dharmasastra is now one of the Hindu scriptures, and variations of the same story show up in Buddhist and Jain scriptures. The Hebrew Bible tells the story of Noah and his family, the only humans to survive an apocalyptic flood, also at the hands of an angry god. The Hebrew Bible also contains another apocalyptic destruction, this time of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Side note, the cities are destroyed for being bad hosts to the angels God sends to visit the cities, not for sodomy, but that's a different story for a different kind of podcast. There are apocalyptic stories in Zoroastrianism, Hinduism, Islam, and some of the Native American religious traditions. Apocalyptic stories are fairly profuse in many religions. In Christian Europe, John's vision of the apocalypse dominated the cultural imagination of the end of the world for centuries. There are some fictional stories that play with John's apocalypse. Piers the Plowman is a medieval English example. I studied it in graduate school. It was way over my head. I don't want to go into it here. But with very few exceptions, it wasn't really until the advent of science fiction opened up new ways of imagining and telling stories that apocalyptic fiction started to become a meaningful fiction genre. As I've already mentioned, we covered science fiction at length in a previous episode. As a quick review, modern science fiction began more or less in the 19th century. One of the most popular titles to get thrown around as the first sci-fi novel is Englishwoman Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, first published in 1818. Not coincidentally, several early sci-fi writers are among the earliest authors of apocalyptic fiction, too. In 1826, Mary Shelley published her novel The Last Man, It's often considered the first major work of post-apocalyptic fiction. The plot follows a group of people trying to survive a global plague. The end of the world wasn't a hugely influential theme, though, in 19th century science fiction. There are a few important works in the genre, or at least works worth mentioning. In 1839, Edgar Allan Poe published his short story, The Conversation of Eros and Charmion, It's a story about a comet that removes all the nitrogen from Earth's atmosphere. Distressingly, the then over-oxygenated atmosphere catches fire. Yikes! H.G. Wells' The Time Machine depicts two apocalypses of a sort when the time traveler arrives in 802,701 CE. He finds that humanity has subdivided into two distinct species— One of them is beautiful and stupid. The other is clever and cannibalistic. He later arrives to find a dying earth under a swollen red sun. And Wells's The War of the Worlds addresses aliens who successfully destroy Victorian England with their advanced weapons. The 19th century also saw the rise of dystopian fiction, especially after John Stuart Mills made an 1868 speech to the British Parliament denouncing the government's Irish land policy. Mills popularized the word dystopia with his claim that, quote, what is commonly called utopian is something too good to be practicable, but what they appear to favor is too bad to be practicable. As I've already mentioned, dystopian fiction is tied to but not the same as apocalyptic fiction. Sometimes an apocalypse brings about a dystopia. Solutions to a world-ending crisis cause more harm than good. Or maybe at the end of things, there's just no good way to run a society. More often, a dystopian society brings about an apocalypse. Either the society is so bad, the world is literally going to end, or the citizens in the dystopia are so trapped within it 
that there is no real hope the world is going to move forward. The story is apocalyptic in the sense that it is the end of history, these problems are unsolvable, the end. From the earliest days of dystopian fiction, the stories have been as much about protesting contemporary society as about predicting the future. In 1879, Jules Verne published The Begum's Fortune. It's a story about the corrupting influence of money and materialism, perhaps even an early critique of the military-industrial complex. In 1907, a Catholic priest named Robert Hugh Benson wrote Lord of the World. It's about the consequences of secularism, humanism, and socialism, and it ends with the Christian apocalypse. Both Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis have praised the book as prophetic. In the early 20th century, there were anti-socialist dystopias like Ayn Rand's 1938 anthem, anti-capitalist dystopias like Jack London's 1908 The Iron Heel, anti-technology dystopias, or at least pro-human dystopias like Aldous Huxley's 1932 Brave New World. There were anti-fascist dystopias, anti-Nazi dystopias. And that takes us up to the 20th century. When we covered Japanese science fiction, we started the episode by mapping global science fiction. After some sort of proto-science fiction texts in Britain and France, American science fiction dominated the genre until the 1960s. Even after the 60s, it was still useful to look at major developments in the genre globally first, and then go back to take a look at how these developments played out in Japan. When it comes to apocalyptic and dystopian fiction, things are a little bit more complicated. Yes, the earliest apocalyptic and dystopian novels are Western European. And yes, the way apocalypse looks in the modern imagination, and probably the idea of dystopia, are more or less European inventions. But by the time Japanese writers had taken up the novel say, by the end of the Meiji period, the Japanese apocalyptic and dystopian novel doesn't follow the same narrative as the English-language apocalyptic novel. Here's my guess. While many apocalyptic fears transcend cultures, I think there's a case that cultures fear different things at different times for particular cultural and historical reasons. Perhaps the way non-Japanese writers tell apocalyptic stories has an influence in Japan, but a lot of specific kinds of anxieties Japanese apocalyptic stories express are specific to Japan at any given moment in time. All of this is to say, I have a reason I'm taking this approach of looking at Anglo-American apocalyptic and dystopian fiction first, But maybe my reasons aren't as strong as they were for looking at Anglo-American science fiction first. You'll see later that the history of Japanese apocalyptic and dystopian fiction is more closely tied to Japan's own history and culture. Nevertheless, this is an English language podcast, and English language fiction does give us interesting context and a way to kind of ground this episode's story. In Britain and the U.S., apocalyptic fiction continued to come out in dribs and drabs throughout the first half of the 20th century. Some of the stories anticipated motifs that we're still exploring in the 2020s. We get technology superseding human will, and then failing, in E.M. Forster's The Machine Stops, published in 1909. We get a deadly, almost world-ending pandemic in Jack London's The Scarlet Plague, published in 1912. We get genetic engineering gone awry in J.J. Connington, Norden Holt's Million, published in 1923. In that one, a man-made bacteria denitrifies and kills all plant life. And we get an asteroid colliding with Earth in Philip Wiley and Edwin Balmer's When Worlds Collide, published in 1933. 
There are also some important dystopian stories in the first half of the 20th century. I've mentioned a few. The most notable ones I've missed are George Orwell's 1984, published in 1949. 1984 depicts a totalitarian state that controls its citizens through surveillance and doublethink. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. You'll see as we continue that language use is a common motif in dystopian literature and apocalyptic literature, especially in the work of Yoko Tawada. Another notable dystopian novel is Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, published in 1953. Fahrenheit 451 depicts a dystopian United States where the government started burning books after people stopped reading them and started watching too much television. There is a lot of apocalyptic fiction from the second half of the 20th century, and I needed to find a coherent way to tell the story. While I was doing my research for this part of the episode, I ran across an article by M. R. Carey on Electric Lit. It's called A Brief History of the End of the World. It's not an academic source, and it's not meant to be, but it's an article by a well-regarded author recognizing patterns in apocalyptic fiction of the second half of the 20th century, so I'm going to use it as an organizational structure. Carey observes that, quote, each wave of doomsday plot devices is different from the one before, and, quote, those changes tell us something about ourselves. He pulls out major threads in late 20th and early 21st century apocalyptic stories that show what fears were on most English-speaking people's minds. Later, you'll have a chance to compare themes of English-language apocalyptic fiction with themes of Japanese apocalyptic fiction. Carey isn't so much making an argument that these are the exclusive themes of apocalyptic fiction during any given decade, just an observation that these themes seem especially prevalent at particular moments in time. Carey begins his account in 1960 when he claims, quote, science fiction began to address itself en masse to the end of the world. According to Carey, before the 1960s, sci-fi doomsday stories were far outweighed by bright millenarian visions. Think about the TV show The Jetsons, where everybody lives happily in the space suburbs with two and a half kids, a pet, and a robo-housekeeper. In science fiction, when there were skirmishes with aliens, heroes like Flash Gordon or Buck Rogers were able to handily save the day. According to Carey, the predominant theme in 1960s apocalyptic fiction is environmental disaster. Again, that doesn't mean there aren't dozens and dozens of stories on other kinds of disasters— just that environmental disaster seems to have been a special focus. Younger listeners might not realize that the 1960s are the decade the public really started to become aware of some of the catastrophes modern technologies and lifestyles were wreaking on the world. For example, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring in 1962. It's a nonfiction book, very important. It's probably one of the most impactful environmental books ever published. Silent Spring describes how chemicals like the pesticide DDT had worked their way up the food chain and were now killing off birds, thus the silent season with no bird song. Actually, Silent Spring includes a sort of mini-apocalyptic story of its own in a chapter called A Fable for Tomorrow, A nameless American town has been robbed of apple blossoms, fish, birds, and even human children by DDT. 1960s apocalyptic fiction offered the same kinds of warnings of environmental disaster as Silent Spring did. J.G. Ballard's 1962 The Drowned World describes ice caps melting because of global warming. Don't let anyone tell you no one knew about global warming that long ago. Anthony Burgess's 1962 The Wanting Seed explores the effects of overpopulation. So does Harry Harrison's 1966 Make Room, Make Room, much better known for its film adaptation, 1973's Soylent Green. 
Spoiler alert for people my age and younger, the climax of Soylent Green is that one of humanity's staple foods is made from human corpses. Soylent Green is people. Sometimes these environmental disasters are directly related to human meddling with the atom. The most enduring example is almost certainly Kurt Vonnegut's 1963 Cat's Cradle. It features a scientist who worked on the Manhattan Project, the group that developed the atomic bomb. The scientist also created a substance called Ice-9. It moves water's melting point from 0 degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, to 45.8 degrees Celsius, or 114.4 degrees Fahrenheit. I won't give away the how, but it's fairly obvious to anyone who knows anything about Vonnegut or sci-fi that Ice-9 ends up freezing all of the world's water and causing an apocalypse. Fears about nuclear war and nuclear fallout became even more dominant in the apocalyptic literature of the 1970s and 1980s. There are, of course, older stories about apocalyptic nuclear fallout. One of the first is a novel called Mr. Adam, A-D-A-M, by Pat Frank, published in 1946. In Mr. Adam, a nuclear power plant explodes and renders the entire male population infertile. Others include Peter Bryant's 1958 Red Alert, later adapted into the Stanley Kubrick film Dr. Strangelove, and Walter Miller's 1959 novel A Canticle for Leibovitz. It's one of my favorites. But, according to Carey, Cold War anxiety took over apocalyptic literature in the 70s and 80s. Looking through a list of 70s and 80s apocalyptic fiction, it turns out many of these novels weren't all that enduring. There is Robert O'Brien's 1974 Zia's for Zachariah. That was another one of my childhood favorites. It is what would today be published as a YA title. One girl is mysteriously shielded from the nuclear apocalypse in her farming valley. A strange man arrives and tries to force her into an Adam and Eve scenario really frightening. It's said that people prefer to watch their sci-fi instead of read it, and that seems to be true of the most popular apocalyptic stories from the 70s and 80s. One example that comes to mind is the very first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. That show premiered in 1987 with an episode that makes vague references to the Earth's age of nuclear horror. Captain Picard and his crew are put on trial without a jury or a lawyer in a dystopian pre-Starfleet society. The biggest apocalyptic stories Carrie's characterization leaves out are Stephen King's 1978 novel The Stand and the Terminator film franchise, which premiered in 1984. The Stand is about a deadly virus that an incompetent government can't stop. Hmm. And The Terminator is about a time traveler trying to prevent a future where artificial intelligence has all but destroyed humanity. Also, hmm. I'm also not sure that Carrie's story takes into account the kinds of anxieties that come up in apocalyptic and dystopian stories by women and people of color. Margaret Atwood's 1985 The Handmaid's Tale is about a society where certain women of childbearing age are forced into concubinage in a religious dictatorship that has taken over the United States. That dictatorship struggles with infertility. In her historical notes at the end of the novel, Atwood explicitly links that fertility to contemporary concerns about radiation, chemical pollution, sexually transmitted infections. So I suppose in a kind of sort of way, it falls under Carrie's characterization. Lois Lowry's 1993 The Giver is another middle-grade novel. It's about a society that has decided to forego pain and conflict by adopting a system of sameness. The protagonist eventually discovers the appalling consequences of the system. Like many works of dystopian and apocalyptic fiction by women, there's a big focus on motherhood and children. We'll see how that's especially true of Japanese fiction later. Octavia Butler's 1993, The Parable of the Sower, 
is an alarmingly prescient dystopia set in 2020's California. The consequences of climate change, corporate greed, and massive income inequality have driven the country to the brink of disintegration. A newly elected radical authoritarian president is loosening labor protections and spouting xenophobia. According to Kerry, the 1990s and 20 aughts were the dawn of the dead, by which I mean that there were an overwhelming number of stories of zombie apocalypse. A lot of people read zombies as metaphors. According to Kerry, they are people in shape only, and they remind us our personhood can be rescinded. Zombies can stand in for all kinds of fears. A deadly plague, like in Max Brooks's 2006 World War Z, Science Gone Awry, in films like 28 Days Later and The Zombie Diaries. In both films, British scientists somehow create zombie viruses, Not sure what people were concerned British scientists were up to in the 2000s. Fears of cell phone signals, like in Stephen King's 2006 Cell. Maybe you're old enough to remember when cell phone signals were going to kill us all. Fears of demons, Brian Keane's 2003 The Rising. Fears of plain old late-stage capitalist hopelessness. Isaac Marion's Warm Bodies and the film Shaun of the Dead. In both of these stories, the mechanism that started turning people into zombies seems like it was plain and simple giving up. Shaun of the Dead even ends with this magnificently funny scene of the zombies being put to work at dead-end jobs and the protagonist playing video games with his dead-beat friend who has been turned into a zombie because all of them were more or less zombies already. And, of course, you can read zombies as terrorists. Remember, this was the era of the war on terror. And zombies are others who go around destroying things and killing people and turning people into zombies for reasons you can't quite understand or at least agree with. Cormac McCarthy's 2006 The Road isn't a zombie story, but it's a story about people so desperate that they act like zombies mindlessly violent and cannibalistic. Although Carrie doesn't note it, the 1990s also saw a couple of notable returns to religious apocalyptic stories. Maybe they were caused by fear that the world would end at the end of the second millennium. In 1990, British authors Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett published Good Omens. It's a satirical story, hypothesizing that all biblical apocalyptic prophecies are true, but also carried out by fairly incompetent angels and demons. The 90s and aughts also saw the hugely popular, now almost entirely forgotten, Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins. This 13-book saga took biblical prophecy seriously and told the story of what might happen if They took place in the late 90s. Carrie doesn't identify a big theme for post-2010 apocalyptic fiction. He just offers an observation that there's a lot more of it. Quote, in the wake of a financial crisis, meaning in 2008, the prospect of having your life suddenly and spectacularly become non-viable has become a day-to-day reality for many. American listeners may not realize that our banking collapse and financial crisis echoed around the world, so this holds true for people in most developed nations. Combine that with rising nationalism, ongoing conflicts across the globe, and a pandemic that we're ignoring but hasn't gone away, it's easy to guess why people are still telling stories about the end of the world. I haven't kept up with contemporary apocalyptic fiction in English. There's just so much of it. You can find several lists on the episode page that include more contemporary titles if you're interested. I will mention a book I found compelling, Louis Erdrich's 2017 Future Home of the Living God. In that book, humans have begun to evolve backward. So the government is abducting all women who are pregnant— including the protagonist. Eventually, she's forced to give birth in a government facility, 
the government takes her healthy baby boy without ever letting her see him. This is a particularly poignant narrative in the hands of a Native American author like Erdrich. She is an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. Native Americans have been subject to forced adoptions. Some Native American authors and activists, like B.L. Blanchard, Stephen Charleston, and Cowboy Smith X, have been pretty vocal about the fact Native Americans have already survived at least one apocalypse, the arrival of Europeans in the Americas and U.S. settlement of the West in the 1800s. Some of the most hopeful narratives about what we can do next to deal with climate change and other disasters come from Native Americans. So that's the story of English language apocalyptic fiction in a nutshell. It's a story that evolves from tales of the end of the world in Western and Central Asia. Modern tales of the end of the world took off in the 19th century and accelerated after World War II. Apocalyptic stories overlap with dystopian stories about human societies gone wrong, and these stories are often warnings about the directions our society is headed. Apocalyptic fiction is an expression of some of our greatest fears. Environmental collapse, nuclear war, science pushing beyond what should be its ethical limits. Increasingly, a society so fractured that it can't endure much longer. In the next section, we'll turn to apocalyptic fiction in Japan. How is its story like the story of English language apocalyptic fiction? How is it different? To what extent do Japan's apocalyptic fears overlap with apocalyptic fears in the English-speaking world? And what concerns does Japan have that are all its own? We've covered a lot of texts today. You can find extensive lists on the episode page. As a matter of fact, the episode page already lists most of the content for all parts of the episode, including what we haven't covered yet, apocalyptic fiction more specifically in Japan, and Yoko Tawada's The Emissary. You can find extensive lists of the texts that we have covered and will cover on the episode page, as well as a complete transcript, external links to more information about many of the ideas we've discussed, and a complete bibliography of my sources. I hope you have a chance to take a look, whether you're book shopping or not. It also isn't too late to pick up a copy of our focus text for this episode. Again, The Emissary by Yoko Tawada. It was translated into English by Margaret Mitsutani. Again, if you're a North American reader, you can support Read Japanese Literature by buying your books through our episode page. You can also support the podcast by leaving a review on your podcast app of choice. Read Japanese Literature is currently a 4.9 star rated podcast with 71 reviews on Spotify. I'm really proud of that and thankful to everyone who has left a review. The best way to support Read Japanese Literature is through Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Remember that Patreon supporters get early access and bonus content for every episode, as well as weekly updates on the podcast and new English language releases of Japanese literature. A special thanks to our new Patreon supporters, especially Paul F., Timu Jalkanen, Alex Bowden, and Typical Anime Employer. Your financial support and your encouragement are really appreciated. We'd love to hear from you about the podcast. There are so many ways to stay in touch through the website, blue sky at read japanese lit dot bsky dot social instagram also at read japanese lit youtube slash at read japanese literature i have a lot of thanks to offer this episode a big thank you to the blue sky community for helping me track down manga titles and manga translators all of the information they helped me track down is already available on the episode page And I'll have the chance to talk about many of the stories in the next part of our episode. A special shout out to Forrest N. for early help brainstorming Japanese apocalyptic stories to include, manga and otherwise. A thank you to the members of the Association of Asian Studies. It was my privilege to meet so many of you in person at the annual conference a few weeks ago. 
Thank you to the Japanese literature groups on Goodreads and Facebook, and to the Japanese literature communities on Blue Sky and Twitter. And as always, thank you to producer Kaim for today's music, kaimmusic.com. K H A I M music.com. <laughs>